here and kind of look at the, the fruits of our labor, if you will, and uh, perform these uh, case-wise uh, diagnostics. So um, I think I called this one, what, New Data 1? Is that what it was? Okay, so I'm going to call this New Data 2. And uh, I'm going to uh, to go through, and uh, I still want success. I still want tutor. Uh, my math lab. Uh, but now I'd like to go through and take a look at uh, some of these things that we did. So I want to look at my standardized residuals. I want to look at... Uh, my DF betas and DF fits. And I want to look at my leverage statistics that I created. Now, new data too. And I um, <laughs> get a plethora of craziness. Now, um, Again, my standardized residuals, something that we can do here. Uh, and I have no idea why this MML.1 occurred. Okay, tutor, yes. Uh, oh, okay, it's just kind of different. Okay, gotcha. Um, All right, so DF betas. Um, all right, let me let me explain everything to you. Going from left to right, uh, success tutor my math lab. These things uh, are, are you know clear. That's just the variables that we started out with. Our standardized residuals. Or, you know, uh, the, as I explained before. And as I look down through there, I don't see anything that uh, raises a flag. Uh, let's say I had you know two or three thousand entries. Uh, what I may want to do is, uh, is, is look at uh, the range of um, standardized residuals. Um, okay. And what that'll do, it'll give me the lowest and the highest. So what I'm looking at there, is there anything below negative uh, 3? anything above three, and there's not, so there's no reason uh, to, to worry much about that. Now, the next part gets kind of confusing because it gives you some new stuff, and I gotta tell you, it uh, kind of kept me, got, got me off guard there for a second. The DF betas, what it does is it calculates a, a value for each predictor, including the intercept. So since we're looking at a two predictor, two predictor model, these three predictors right here, the two original plus the, the, the intercept, uh, tells us the, uh, the DF betas. So uh, remember, uh, we're looking down through here to see if anything is, um, is, is bigger than... Uh, so, uh, for example, it's got um, mymathlab.1. So what we may do is come down here and do a range.1. Um, okay, what's going on here? Guys, we got to attach uh, new data to. Now I want to go range, and you'll see that we get uh, nothing uh, that's this greater than one. So uh, the DF betas uh, seem to give me no problem. The next thing we see are the DF fits, and uh, again, are there any that uh, above one? Uh, you can eyeball it real quickly and see that there's not, but um, the DF fits. Uh, this way we can see that there, there aren't as well. And then we get out to our leverage statistics. Uh, I think our leverage statistics, what did we say? Um, anything above 0.5. And uh, as I eyeball that, uh, it doesn't appear to be anything above 0.5. So, uh, guys, I... When I run my individual case-wise diagnostics, I see um, I see no reason to uh, to, to have any uh, problem with the case-wise diagnostics. Now, gang, next thing I want to do is I want to get into multicollinearity. 
uh, is that a threat to this analysis? So uh, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, about multicollinearity. Um, guys, there's going to be uh, two measures that we're going to um, look at. It's called VIF. It's called the Variance Inflation Factor. Uh, and the tolerance, which turns out to just be uh, the inverse of the Variance Inflation Factor. And what these two things allow us to do is they allow us to investigate to see if uh, multicollinearity uh, is going to be a problem. Now, first of all, uh, let, uh, you, know, uh, you know, what is multicollinearity? Uh, and this is a statistical phenomena. That uh, causes our... Uh, standard errors uh, to go wacky. In other words, the standard errors uh, would uh, get the, the extremely large uh, under certain situations. Uh, primarily caused by highly correlated predictor variables. And uh, guys, insert uh, uh, highly correlated continuous predictor variables. Just to give you a, kind of a rundown of some things that, uh, that can uh, happen. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, indications of multicollinearity. Uh, one uh, thing uh, that, that happens uh, if we add or delete a predictor variable, and uh, the regression coefficients change drastically. If this happens, then multicollinearity may be a problem for you. I can't help but think of, uh, uh, here's your sign. Uh, I forget that. So uh, guys, let's say that we're predicting something and we get negative 2 plus 3x1 plus 4x2 minus 6x3. Uh, and we decide that we want to drop out, uh, uh, delete um, uh, the predictor x3. And we get a new model that says 10 minus 4x1 minus 7x2. Notice how these predictor coefficients, the, co the coefficients of our regression, uh, uh, the regression coefficients change drastically. Uh, that uh, may indicate... Um, uh, uh, multicollinearity. Probably, in fact, it probably would. Uh, there's something also uh, that deals with the extra sum of squares issue. Uh, more specifically, if the extra sum of squares values significantly, uh, depending on which of the variables are in the model, uh, then there's potential effect of uh, multicollinearity. So if we've got uh, you know, say three predictors as we do here, and uh, say we delete one of the predictors, uh, then if the extra sum of squares varies significantly uh, by taking one out, then uh, that, that, that could be uh, an indication of multicollinearity. Uh, the simplest one, I was about ready to skip over this one, uh, extra large standard errors. 
are uh, an indication of multicollinearity. And uh, probably the one that I look for the most uh, is just the, the common sense perspective. Uh, if, if I know that there's a clear theoretical relation between a set of predictors and a response uh, variable, uh, but the uh, individual coefficients aren't statistically significant, then uh, this could be an indication of multicollinearity. For example, if I was trying to, to, you know, to predict something from uh, maybe a two-predictor model, and I know there's a clear theoretical relationship between uh, x1, x2, and, and my y, and uh, let's say that I had uh, ample power, and I was getting p-values greater than or equal to 0.05, then I may have uh, have an issue of multicollinearity. Guys, at the end of the day, the clearest way, the best way, is to calculate a, your variance inflation factor. And if your variance inflation factor is above 10, then uh, investigate uh, multicollinearity. Because chances are you got that going on, and that uh, it, uh, it should be investigated. Now, what is this VIF that I'm going to teach you about? Uh, variance inflation factor. I <laughs> can't believe I'm going to say this. It should be obviously clear to you that it deals with variance, and it deals with factor, and it deals with inflation. Uh, well, guys, it's kind of exactly what it does. Uh, the variance inflation factor. Uh, tells us by what factor the variance of each estimated yeah. Tells us about what factor the variance of each uh, estimated coefficient is inflated as compared to when the predictors are uncorrelated. So guys, at the end of the day, we want our predictors uh, to be perfectly uncorrelated. I guess that's when we get the, you know, our soundest model. And um, so uh, this uh, variance inflation, again, tells us by what uh, um, uh, the, the factor by which the variance is, uh, is inflated. So, uh, for example, let's say that we get a variance inflation factor for... Uh, some predictor, let's say x1, and let's just say that uh, the variance inflation factor for this, uh, we run it as 100, so this is uh, clearly greater than 10. So it provides a, uh, in, an indication of uh, multicollinearity issue. So what we'd say here is we would just say that the variance uh, in the estimated regression coefficient for x1 is 100 times higher than if the set of predictors were uncorrelated. Now, another thing that we sometimes look at is we look at the mean variance inflation factor. Now, you'll have uh, a variance inflation factor for each uh, predictor. So clearly, if you uh, have, you're predicting y from x1 plus x2 plus x3, then you're clearly going to have a variance inflation factor actually for, for the four coefficients. Uh, you'll have a variance inflation factor for uh, x1, x2, and uh, 
in X3. That got it. I thought I had this thing fixed, but um, apparently I didn't. So uh, let's say, for example, that uh, we add up all of our variance inflation factors and we get a mean variance inflation factor of, say, 400. Uh, what we would say here is that uh, this, this is more of a issue of the, the, the sum of squares for our overall model. Uh, here we'd say um, that the expected sum of squares for the model including all predictors is 400 times larger than it would be if all predictors were uncorrelated. Now you might be thinking, well, why don't you just look at scatter plots across all your continuous predictors? Well, that's exactly what you do. But there's also model diagnostics, uh, you know, well, uh, uh, case-wise uh, diagnostics too, uh, that you run uh, uh, in its case, or in, in each case, to, to, um, to, to assess multicollinearity. Um, so guys, uh, one more thing, actually. Um, the assumption of linearity. you notice uh, kind of going in reverse to what I... Uh, uh, presented to you in a couple of videos ago. Uh, the assumption of uh, linearity uh, focuses on the relationship uh, between uh, x I should say all x's, but uh, you know, uh, predictor by predictor, uh, focuses on the relationship between x and uh, the log of y. An agreed upon approach uh, is to do uh, the following. Now, guys, it's going to be a little weird, so... Uh, <laughs> Don't skip. Let's say, for example, that we wanted to predict y from x1, x2, and x3. So we essentially we end up with a three predictor model, so we'll have four uh, estimated regression coefficients. To test the assumption of linearity, an agreed upon approach would be to create three new variables. The first new variable we, we create will focus on x1. And I'm going to call this log x1, although that's not what we would do. What we would do is we would take x1 times the log of x1. So we're creating three new variables for each continuous predictor. This, in this new, new uh, uh, variable, it's just the value times the log of the value. So we do that for all the, uh, the values in uh, the, the predictor x1. And guys, we would, um, the illustration I have here, we do it for x2. So again, create three new variables. So in other words, however many continuous predictors that we have, we're going to create that many new variables. The next thing we're going to do is we would run uh, a general linear model 
and we would predict y from x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus log x1 plus log x2 plus log x3. Oh, and by the way, don't forget family equal binomial. If log x1, log x2, or log x3 is statistically significant, then that variable violates the linearity assumption. The theory behind this is really cool. Uh, I couldn't produce it right now. Uh, but I just, I remember I've seen it before. Um, so, uh, for example, if log x1 has uh, a p-value less than 0.05, then our predictor x1 does not have a linear relation with the log of y. Okay, so um, it has violated uh, the assumption, the assumption of linearity uh, of uh, of the legit. All right, gang. One more thing. Uh, uh, reporting the results. Um, I don't think I have any clean paper. No, nope. hold on. Let me uh, see if I have a clean piece of paper that I can write on. Yeah, let's see, I do. Uh, let's talk about reporting the results. Um, which you guys will be doing in your homework assignment, which is uh, coming up. Going to work on it tomorrow. Well, I started working on it a bit. Uh, going to fi finalize it tomorrow. Uh, reporting the results, uh, you know, I think you would report the results of uh, logistic regression uh, much the same way you would for just uh, linear regression. Uh, I would want some uh, presentation of the coefficients. Uh, I would think that would include the betas the standard errors for the betas, uh, the p-values, uh, and the, um, the exp, uh, the betas, or the e raised to the, to the betas. And this is for interpretation purposes. All right. Uh, I would think you'd also want uh, confidence intervals uh, for EXP betas. So I'd want the point estimate and the, and the confidence interval uh, for each of the predictors. Uh, another thing I'd want, uh, I would want uh, some model diagnostics. And I would think here we would want uh, R squared and uh, the goodness of fit uh, diagnostic. And uh, I would probably want to examine the model change uh, in terms of the chi-square. So guys, something that you would probably, uh, a table that you'd probably want to in, uh, include if you want to get full credit. Uh, is uh, something I don't know, probably have the variables. And uh, next I would want the uh, betas along with the standard errors. So, you know, whatever. 
And then I would probably want uh, the 95% confidence interval for the odds ratio. And the lower estimate and upper. Uh, something like that. And of course, you guys down below here, I'd want to come in with some model diagnostics just as you would again for simple linear regression. I would probably um, come in with the hosmer uh R squared. And then I would come in with my model um, Uh, and the p-value, uh, whatever it may be. All right, so gang, that's uh, that's going to be the expectation. So you're going to have a couple of uh, logistic regression problems to to take a look at, and you'll have uh, one uh, log linear analysis. And uh, let's see, once we get done with uh, with this, the, the second component of the class, we'll get into factor analysis. Um, we'll get into some... Um, um, well, I guess um, we're going to do test reliability, uh, reliability and validity last. So I guess we'll do factor analysis and rotations and uh, different things, uh, different things there. So, gang, that's all I got. Take care.